I'd like to move in now to the second part of this first period. I've, I've talked a little bit about some of the influences, the, uh, the tendency to be quite behavioral, the emphasis upon correlational study, the emphasis on measurement and testing being, being quite profound. And as the, these uh, things progressed, you saw some uh, repeated tendencies relative to views of reading. Uh, some of them I've already mentioned that reading was a receptive act, uh, not so much the creation of meaning. The people first had to learn to read bef before they could read to learn. In other words, they could read and learn from material where there was an emphasis on teaching beginning reading skills rather than, than comprehension. And all of this, and you'll, over the course, you'll s see a break from this. To a large extent, or almost entirely, people were focused on what, what people do in their head. Uh, reading wasn't viewed at, as, as a social act uh, in particular. Uh, but as, as the uh, testing industry progressed and as the reading as a receptive act uh, was emphasized, you, you had a breaking up of reading and writing and study skills and listening skills and a proliferation of tests, uh, particularly in conjunction with World War II, in conjunction with um, the recruitment of a, a wide range of people using tests to actually diagnose or assess uh, potential career paths as, as uh, people were being entered into the, into the military. What was more, most interesting was coming out of those uh, war years was some interesting political context. You had, uh, in a sense, uh, bookends being emphasized. And I say bookends because they, they represent uh, age parameters. You, you saw a heavy emphasis, again, on preparing kids for reading or reading readiness, uh, a heavy emphasis on beginning reading, and then you also saw the beginnings of an emphasis upon what was called reading in the content area and, and study skills. At the same time, as you, you saw happening politically, uh, a breaking up of the world into blocks, an Eastern bloc, which would include Russia and China, and a Western bloc, which would include Europe and, and the US. And a fair amount of competition between those blocks, particularly around technological advantage, economic advantage, and social progress, uh, including educational progress. And uh, these issues uh, catapulted forward, uh, particularly as Russia uh, launched Sputnik far ahead of, of the US. And so all of a sudden, the U.S. started examining itself and the, all the countries started examining itself and were asking tough questions about education. Interestingly, a very famous book, popular book was published at that time called Why Johnny Can't Read. And the question became one of, well, what do we need to do to put in place at the beginning stages of reading, that, that book end, and also meeting the people's needs at the end. What do we need to put in place to make sure that our students are getting the best methods? And what we had occur in the, in the educational field was almost like a, a, a set of horse races. Uh, people were developing different methods for beginning reading, sometimes heavy emphasis on phonics, sometimes heavy emphasis on teaching kids whole words and sometimes a mix. And they were, in a sense, putting those methods against each other uh, to see which one, in terms of the tests that they developed, the standardized tests, which one would be better for the students. Indeed, you had, uh, well, this is uh, one book that deals with about 200 different beginning reading methods that, that appeared at that point in time. And I'm sure if you went from school to school, you would have seen thousands and thousands of different approaches. And you had a, a famous educator at uh, Harvard at that time, Jean Chaw, write her book, Learning to Read the Great Debate. Indeed, I suspect it was in this period, the search for, best for the best method uh, would be considered when the reading wars started. 
where people got very much involved, almost like Republicans versus Democrats in the US, but all over the world, people were developing methods and sort of saying that they, their method is best for these reasons. And if we put it in a comparison with others, I'm sure it will do better. Well, finally, the federal government put a lot of money behind what they called a co cooperative, the cooperative first grade studies. And that was an attempt to look at uh, what would be the best method of teaching reading. And so let me sort of diagram a little bit of what, what happened here. So we, we had the, um, the political context, and I would say it's a global context, uh, but it's also uh, international because what you actually had was a sort of a competition over approaches. Uh, that was spurred by global competition and then within countries, different people advocating different approaches. And you also uh, had uh, these media sort of releases as well, where they depicted um, schools as failing, uh, which is a little bit not unlike what uh, we still see experience, experience today in the media. In reality, uh, you know, schools are not doing more poorly, by the way. Whenever we've actually compared uh, kids on the same tests over time, kids are, kids are always improving. And particularly when you take into account the new literacies that they're, they're being asked to develop. But the media uh, drew attention and then we, we had um, what I call the start of the reading wars uh, leading into the federal government supporting this major effort, uh, the cooperative first grade studies, which is a, a, was a massive undertaking all over the, this, uh, the US in particular, but in several countries, people were actually look, putting one method against another. Interestingly, what did they find? What's the, what's the, 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 the best method? Well, s sadly, or I think, probably predictably in hindsight, um, they really didn't come out with the best method that fit every circumstance. Indeed, it depended upon the situation. Some methods work better than others. Um, and so uh, they found what would be called uh, situation-specific effects. And then they also found what is the, the most common result of any educational research experiment, and one is if you're doing educational research, you need to set yourself up so you can be open to this, is a treatment by aptitude or ability effect. In other words, different kids of different abilities and different aptitudes respond differently to different methods. So you've got this situation-specific finding, you've got this treatment aptitude ability effect, which is, is widespread in, in pretty well any educational study of any method, whether it be reading or mathematics or whatnot. It's, it, again, it's probably the most common finding. And then you've got another effect, which is consistent with situation-specific. And, and that is, it depends upon the teacher. If a teacher embraces a method, chances are they would be relatively the, the affected with that, uh, that method. And so all of a sudden, and you've also got another uh, finding that, that came out of here, by the way, and, and that is that standardized tests are quite lame in terms of showing effects of methods. If you really want to see the effects of a method, don't look to a standardized test to do it. So if you're going to do a study looking at anything and you don't get much results in terms of a standardized test, join the club. Repeatedly, we rarely get effects from standardized tests. And it, it, it always sort of it makes me sort of depressed when I see a study where a person has invested a lot of time and all they're using is standardized tests to measure effects. Or if the government starts talking about the fact that they're using a standardized test and I think it's a, well chances are they're not going to show any effect. A standardized tests are too global, too general to show the sorts of effects tied to specific 
uh, specific methods. Well, what's interesting so, is. Well, well, sir, can we take a break? Surely. Yeah, no, I just want to move the chair or the table back so you can, because you were going off camera. So I'm going to move it all the way here just so that when you do take your step to the, the side, okay. you can bump into here. Okay. And it'll keep you a frame. Let's see how that is. If you sure. just go up right against it. Yep. That gives you good. Was that your problem, Sharon, or another one? Yeah. Yeah, well, you were slowly drifting off okay. the frame. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So, sorry about that. Uh, That's okay, I think that was at a natural break. You you were just wrapping up on standardized tests, and you were about to go to the next topic. Okay, great. So, um, so we, 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 we had the results relative to standardized tests. But in, indeed, you know, you might sort of say, well, uh, this is sort of depressing. We, we can't find the best method. But in reality, the finding is much more profound. The, the, the most successful methods are likely to be methods that are shaped in the context of classrooms to meet kids' needs from different backgrounds uh, in accordance with the specific situations uh, where, where they're from and where, the, where they uh, where they go to school and, and, and so on. So you saw coming out of here uh, an interest in uh, formative studies. And, and by that studies that are, are, are much more closely crafted to what you're, what you're, uh, uh, what you're studying. But you're also seeing another thing, which was part of the findings here that I haven't mentioned at this point. Um, a repeated finding out of this beginning reading research was, is typically we were seeing um, students um, who would perform well for the first couple of years of school uh, as measured on the tests, which were pretty limited tests. They tend to be uh, uh, tests of uh, sentence comprehensions or word knowledge. But as you move forward into, let's say, the third grade or fourth grade, where the test might involve comprehension measures, you saw a decline. And so kids who might be succeeding very well in the second grade, all of a sudden perform poorly. I think to a large extent it was related to the fact that people really hadn't connected uh, learning to read to a meaning-centered approach. And so you, you have the beginnings of an interest in uh, a concept called eclecticism, which is a mixture of approaches which, which focused upon learning to read, dovetailed with a sort of a reading to learn approach or a, more, a meaning oriented approach. But even more so, you're getting people asking the question, well, what about reading comprehension? And this is sort of a precursor to the next lecture, lecture which is the cognitive turn. The federal government in the US and governments all over the world started to ask themselves the question, hey, we've invested a huge amount of money in, in helping kids learn to read, but what about reading to learn? Do we really know much about comprehension? Is comprehension tied up with intelligence? Is it tied up with a sort of uh, uh, a, a child's given abilities? Or is it something that you can teach? What do we know about comprehension? Is this something that follows from reading or is it an integral part of it? And so we had in this 60s period, this amazing precursor to what I found, what, uh, where I sort of entered the field actually, in the late 60s and early 70s, a growing interest, a lot of investment all over this world in the study of reading comprehension. It couldn't have happened at a better time because scholars from different fields also were interested in this question. Scholars from computer science, uh, artificial intelligence, scholars who were interested in linguistics, particularly psycholinguistics, and interested in shifting to looking at fuller text rather than just sentences. And other people all of a sudden were coming together in a sort of a confluence which I think many of us um, agree uh, 
perpetuated almost a zeitgeist in terms of a shift in our thinking about uh, the nature of meaning making. A shift in our thinking which I think is, is pr profound uh, that, inf that should be viewed as a, as a moment in history um, that is of significance in terms of even going back to sort of uh, early Greek or early Chinese discussions of meaning making. So I'll expand upon these areas uh, as we move to the next lecture where I talk about these things in conjunction with talking about what I refer to as the cognitive term. Thanks very much.